Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats. First of all, I would like to say um, you know, that we have a different venue, as you know, uh, and it is because of circumstances, as you also know, and I apologize for any inconvenience caused. And then also I apologize on behalf of the vice chancellor that he can't be here. He sent his apologies. Um, Brenda, to you in particular, um, he is occupied currently with, with the situation and try to resolve what has been quite a, a hectic situation today. Prof. Fer Frederico, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. Prof. Brenda Schaumann. Prof. Hamilton, who's going to be our respondent this evening. Um, there's senior leaders, and there's members of Senate, many of you, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Brenda Schaumann. I wish to express also a very warm welcome to all the family, friends of Professor Brenda. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Shaman, and of course also for colleagues at UJ. Inaugurations, many a times pompous and decadent, but hopefully mostly, mostly dignified, well-meaning, we are told date back to ancient Greece as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into high office. And it marks the formal assumption of office or position of authority. And so, did, uh, and so today is that day that marks the rites of passage and the entry of Professor Schaumann into the distinguished community of universities' most senior scholars. It is indeed an office and a position of authority and leadership, which we shall not assume lightly, but shall do so with considerable and ongoing thought, reflection, deliberation, and presence of mind. I am reminded that inaugurations usually follow well after the actual appointment to the role of post. I think, Brenda, you confirmed that you were appointed in 2013, March 2013, and are often a test and an indication as to whether the incumbent <coughs> still finds the now somewhat older role or office as interesting as at the time of the interview. And so we shall observe <laughs> Professor Shaman's tonight with more than an ordinary level of interest to see if that excitement <laughs> is still present. I remarked earlier that the professorial inauguration is as important to the incumbent and their loved ones and colleagues as it is to the university. I say this since the inaugural lecture is as much a reflection on the state and the intent of the contemporary university <coughs> and how it measures up to Professor Schaumann's inaugural lecture on toppled statues and fallen icons, negotiating monuments to British imperialism and Afrikaner nationalism at post-apartheid universities. I think it's a very relevant topic in the times of higher education. I'm also reminded that very few books are available in decent bookstores and what it is to be a professor, and in particular, what the freedoms and duties of this most senior scholar of the university is. In this regard, I offer you the reflections of Bruce McFailen, who in his book, Intellectual Leadership in Higher Education, Renewing the Role of the University Professor, seeks to correct this oversight and argues convincingly that given the corporate, corporate, cor, corpu, 
ratisation of the research agenda, professors must reclaim professional leadership and that they must thus occupy a very special role. Specifically, McFarlane argues that two freedoms, namely that of critic and advocate, are essential for professors to ex execute their four duties, being those of, first of all, mentor, secondly, guardian of standards, thirdly, enabler of networking and mobilizer of resources for others, and fourthly, ambassador for the institution or discipline. So this evening, we will have only one small insight into how Brenda responds to this call for the return of professorial leadership. I'm now calling on Professor Freshy to just introduce the candidate in a few words, and thereafter she will address us. Thank you. Thank you, Registrar. Um, very good evening to all of you, specifically to Professor Hamilton, our respondent, of course, to Professor Brenda Schmarman, to the colleagues and guests, guests from other universities. I see people from WITS, I see people from UNISA, I see people from Pretoria. Lovely to have you all here. Um, Brenda joined the University of Johannesburg as a professor with research specialization in March 2013. And as from at the beginning of next year, 2016, she takes up the position of the NRF Sarchi Chair in South African Art and Visual Culture. That's a great honor and privilege for us in the Faculty of Art and Design and Architecture that she was awarded this uh, Sarchi Chair. Professor Schmarman has more than three decades of academic experience. Uh, she was Professor of Art History and Visual Culture at Rhodes University between 2002 until her move to UJ, a period that included a seven-year stint as Head of Fine Art and she was formerly a staff member in the History of Art Department at the University of the Witwatersrand. And in fact, I took up her job when she left. <laughs> um, she's a holder of a, a B rating by the NRF and winner of the Vice-Chancellor's Book Medal in 2007 at Rhodes University. Um, she's also very active in research and in professional bodies. She's a former president of the South African Visual Arts Historians, She's a long-standing member of the Arts College of the African Studies Association, or ACASA, in the United States. She served an extended term on the NRF's panel for rating scholars in the performing and creative arts, and is a member of the Standing Committee of Humanities of the Academy of Science of South Africa, or ASAF. Book review editor and editorial board member of the journal De Arte since the late 1990s, and on the advisory group of the Art Book, a journal published until 2011 by the Art History Association in the United Kingdom. She frequently acts as a scholarly reader for journals and publishers. Much of her scholarship is focused on gender and on exploring and analyzing the works of women artists in mainstream contexts, as well as practitioners working in the context of community projects. She also has specialist interest in the politics of public art and thorny questions it raises about transformation. Editor of Material Matters, applicates by the Weya Women of Zimbabwe and Needlework by South African Collectives, uh, published by Wits University Press in 2000, and co-editor with Marion Arnold of Between Union and Liberation, Women Artists in South Africa, 1910 to 1994, uh, published by Ashgate Publishing in the UK. Brenda is author of Through the Looking Glass, Representations of Self by South African Women Artists, uh, published in 2000 by David Critt. Mapula, Embroidery and the Empowerment, sorry, em Embroidery and Empowerment in the Winterfelt, um, also published by David Critt in 2006. And most recently, of Picturing Change, Curating Visual Culture at Post-Apartheid Universities, published by Wits University Press in 2013. She's the co-editor of a special issue of African Arts on gender and South African art. Uh, that was in winter 2012. She has organized panels for a number of international conferences and is the international chair of the session on gender at the CIHA, or the International Committee of Art History Congress, which is going to be held in Beijing in 2016. 
She has published numerous journal articles and book chapters and has curated two large-scale exhibitions which have traveled to museums across the country, each over the duration of a year. Brenda Schmarman is recently co-edited with Kim Miller of Wheaton College uh, in the United States, a volume on public art in South Africa, which is un currently undergoing review with an international publisher. She's also busy working on a book on the Keith Karma art project. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, my great pleasure to invite Professor Brenda Schmarman to the podium. <laughs> Thank you very much for all being here tonight. Sometime prior to March 2013, when I was in the happy position of taking up a professorship here at the University of Johannesburg, a sequence of events took place that marked the beginnings of my interest in the topic of this inaugural address. While pertaining to another university, they would serve as the starting point for thoughts about monuments at universities more generally, including, as you will see later in this address, those at our own institution. In late 2008, when I was a professor at Rhodes University, I wrote a letter on behalf of the institution's gender forum to the vice chancellor at the time, Salim Badat. Mooting for the relocation of various portraits of former vice chancellors and chairs of council, which had been hanging in the council chamber since the 1960s, the letter focused on the possible inappropriateness of displaying images of uniformly white and male figureheads in such a context. Although I'd in fact envisaged the letter simply for consideration of the vice chancellor himself, it ended up being submitted to faculty boards for their consideration also and there it became the subject of heated argument. Sabina Marshall suggests that many white South Africans are reluctant to condone any adjustments to the placement of inherited art, not because they necessarily share values associated with the works in question, but rather because they perceive such acts as threats to their sense of cultural identity and their future in the country. And this tendency unfortunately played out in this instance. When I attended faculty board meetings to respond to the document, it became evident to me that the suggestion to relocate the portraits was misunderstood by some as just the first move within a larger agenda to eradicate signs of each and every contribution made by white men. But it also became clear to me that for many who were concerned about speeding up transformation through shifting objects displayed at the university, and who therefore supported the proposal fully, ideas about representation were grasped in narrow and hardline terms. While the original letter had taken issue with the display of portraits in that particular context, rather than intending to question the value of portraiture per se, many who supported the proposal viewed the portrait tradition itself as simply Eurocentric and of no value. When I expressed regret that the institution had no museum for institutional histories to which portraits might be relocated, a number of those in favor of the proposal agreed with me. This was not, however, because they shared my perception of such a museum as a dynamic space for discursive engagement, but rather because they conceived of it as a kind of Derridian archive. That's a place that enables forgetfulness in the sense that it consigns uncomfortable histories to oblivion. It was a salient lesson to me about, about the, the fact that evaluating art in light of transformative agendas is very, very slippery terrain. Although the debate was protracted, it ultimately had a happy outcome. In May 2010, it was agreed that the portraits of university leaders be relocated outside the council chamber, and that I chair a working group to present ideas to Senate and Council on possible replacement works for the council chamber itself. And I'd meanwhile come up with, come up with what I thought was really a compelling idea for the chamber, and having obtained the necessary support for it, we were able to implement it promptly. We commissioned a work exploring the history of Rhodes University from the Keith Karma Art Project, 
a community project in the village of Hamburg in the Eastern Cape, one that was actually initiated by Carol Hoffmeyer, a master's graduate of the visual art department at this university. A collective which, apart from Hoffmeyer, is comprised of Isikosa-speaking members, the Kieskama Art Project had six years earlier produced its memorable Kieskama Tapestry, which is on permanent loan to Parliament and which parodies the Bayo Tapestry. Literary theorist Linda Hutchin identifies ironical inversion or a process in which repetition is used to emphasize difference as key to the genre of parody. And this is true of the Kieskama Tapestry where reference to the Bayo Tapestry's engagement with the Norman conquest of England in 1066 is used to highlight the impact of Britain's own invasion of South Africa via the frontier wars that were fought against the Amakosa in the Eastern Cape. The idea for the Rhodes University Tapestry was that it would also involve an ironical inversion of the Bayo Tapestry. If the medieval work represented an event that had resulted in the privileging of Norman cultural ideas over those of the English, its parody would enable critical reflection on the impact of Britain's own imperialism on Rhodes University. It should also be noted that the building, including the council chamber, is on the exact site of the old Drosdy, the key structure in what had been the military headquarters of the British colonial government prior to it becoming the site of the university. The inclusion of a work by Isikosa speakers in this particular locale thus enabled a metaphorical occupation of the space by people who'd been divested of not only their lands as a result of the frontier wars, but also any agency within a new cultural order. There's a detail in the Rhodes University tapestry which is especially pertinent. Its fourth panel, which examines the university in the post-apartheid era, makes reference in its top border to the portraits which were previously in the council chamber, as well as their relocation. The work thus records a history of display within the very room where it is located. And more particularly, this imagery prompts questions about how works of art which is symptomatic of um, social exclusions in prior periods, might be treated within a new dispensation. Since the demise of the Soviet Union, huge sculptures of Lenin or Stalin have been toppled from their pedestals, ending up broken like the ideals they stood for in sculpture parks that have been established to contain them. But until recently, South Africa had not seen this kind of response to works associated with ideologies that have fallen out of favor. In the immediate post-apartheid context, where the focus was on reconciliation, it was instead felt that different cultural groupings should each have opportunities for people and incidents pertinent to their histories to be commemorated. Although universities have sometimes removed small artworks or as with the portraits at Rhodes University, have relocated them, they've tended for the most part to leave larger monuments and sculptures alone. But events earlier this year at the University of Cape Town involved a departure from this approach. As this, um, this audience will recall, about a dozen protesters gathered in front of a large and imposing sculpture of Cecil John Rhodes on the 9th of March. Calling for the removal of the work, as well as an end to racism, they argued to be operative at the university, the group's protest culminated in one participant tossing a bucket of human excrement over the sculpture. This event ignited a large-scale protest. On the 11th of March, the university's SRC issued a formal statement which clarified students' perceptions that the retention of the work was symptomatic of a lack of transformative actions being taken by the university. Developing into the roads must fall campaign, the protest included occupation of the university's Bremner building, which houses its executive. UCT Senate was almost unanimous in their decision to permanently remove the sculpture of Cecil Rhodes from campus one that was ratified by the university's council on the 8th of April. Working in cooperation with National Heritage, 
The sculpture was moved into an off-campus venue for safekeeping on the 9th of April, where it would remain while decisions were taken what to do with it. These steps may well have been the only feasible one the institution could have in fact taken in the context of a protest that was rapidly escalating in scale and intensity. And I'd want to emphasize that my purpose here is certainly not to suggest that UCT acted inappropriately. But I'm unconvinced that the removal of objects deemed offensive is in fact the ideal strategy to be followed under less pressing circumstances. While the relocation of works can be constructive, placing works in permanent storage or ensuring their riddance is rather more problematical. And what I want to do here is to suggest some difficulties with removal I have in principle and thereafter to explore some cr more creative and I think more productive engagements with inherited objects that have happened on South African campuses. Eusebius MacKaiser draws attention to, and I'm quoting, the aesthetic and moral assault on one's entire being that occurs when a black person walks across a campus covered with statues and monuments that celebrate colonial conquerors as heroes, unquote. So they're clearly offensive. And while recognizing that monuments of this type are often experienced as profoundly offensive and, and that these, these sentiments are very real, it also needs to be acknowledged that for many, their removal is seen as, the, as simply as the first step towards or being symbolic of other kinds of changes that are perceived to be much more fu fundamental. And artworks are actually perceived as relatively inconsequential within this larger set of aims. One consequently needs to be quite mindful. One needs to be mindful that one doesn't end up denuding campuses of objects to meet the demands of individuals who are not actually particularly concerned about the visual domain. A view that removing an art object off campus permanently is necessary to decolonize the university also usually involves an underlying belief that the work concerned has meaning and significance which is definitive and fixed. Overlooking how highly critical views about British imperialism or Afrikaner nationalism will necessarily affect the degree of authority a sculpture produced under the influence of such ideas might exert in the 21st century, it also tends to promote somewhat one-dimensional views of historical figures. From an art historical point of view, such flattening art may also result in evaluations that consider the worth of art objects only in terms of the people or events they venerate and overlooks the, the other areas of potential significance and meaning. It's notable, for example, that hardly any public discourse on the sculpture of Cecil Rhodes at UCT named its maker at all. And there was no publication amongst the many reports on the incidents circulating in the media that considered her place within South African history. Yet Marion Walgate was in fact one of the first female sculptors working in the public domain in South Africa. And she produced this portrait of Rhodes in an era when prestigious com commissions went to women very rarely. While she certainly employed many imperialist tropes, the work is also bound up with a gender politics surrounding its making and commissioning. And this complicates and unsettles a reading of it as being nothing more than a symbol and symptom of imperialism. Removal can also sometimes prevent transformative actions rather than enable them. If one considers the history of another portrait of Rhodes, this time at Rhodes University, one finds an excellent illustration of this. From the early 1960s, Rhodes University kept at the threshold of its main administrative building and the formal entrance to the university two portraits made by Henry Pegram, one of Cecil Rhodes and the other of Alfred Byte that had been bequeathed to the institution in the early 20th century. It also displayed at the entrance to its East London campus a framed photograph of Cecil Rhodes. When in 1994, and just a few months after the first democratic election, Rhodes University Senate received a motivation for a name change for the university, the proposal was turned down. 
Those against the proposal felt that Rhodes had become a brand and that the university was not using the name to pay homage to an individual. Such an argument was, however, difficult to sustain when portraits of Cecil John Rhodes were displayed at key positions on both of its campuses. The upshot was that the photograph of Rhodes in East London and subsequently the portrait busts at the entrance to the main campus were removed. In other words, by removing these portraits, Rhodes University was not seeking to motivate to change its name, but quite the opposite, it was looking to justify retaining it. While the dismantling of Walgate's sculpture of Rhodes at UCT wasn't shaped by a similar agenda, its permanent removal from campus may nevertheless have foreclosed a self-reflexive engagement with Rhodes's legacy at the institution. Staff members Jeremy Seekings and Nicole Natras argue that by allowing a focus on the pain of those offended by the statue to override tolerance for other sorts of debates and indeed to create opportunities for sustained argument about what might be done with the removed sculpture, the university missed the chance to consider the possibility of, for example, developing a museum enabling a critical study of imperialism. And in fact, they went further, and I quote, handing the statue to someone else to deal with may th make us think we now have clean hands, but this is an illusion. By banishing the statue off campus, Senate sent the shameful message that we can wash our hands by othering privilege and ignoring that we ourselves are implicated in a privileged project that has benefited and will continue to benefit us." Unquote. But if removal is not then a productive solution for monuments associated with ideologies that have fallen from favor, it's surely also highly problematical to fail to mediate or contextualize them in any way. This may well be misconstrued as suggesting that the works in question continue to be objects of admiration and overlooks their capacity to promote feelings of exclusion as well as offense. A question arises then about what kinds of interventions are productive and feasible. And what I want to do is to suggest some of these in the remainder of this address. The William Cullen Library at Fitz University has long owned two prominently placed murals. Colin Gill's Colonists 1826, donated to the university in 1934, just after the library had been built, and J.M. Amshevitz's Vasco da Gama, Departure for the Cape, which the university had commissioned and acquired a year later. The murals are on the upper part of a double volume room, with the Gill work facing the entrance and the Amshevitz work on your left. The right wall, however, remained empty for some 60 years. The paintings by Amshevitz and Gill were intricately bound up with the imperialist mindset of the University of the Witwatersrand's Rand Lord benefactors. Rheingard Nethersoll explains this well, and I quote her. The connection made between the mining magnates and the Portuguese voyagers whose civilizing mission under harsh conditions had been taken up by the 1820 settlers successfully buttressed the British colonial foundation myth of South Africa. The tale began with the arrival of the Portuguese and continued with the arrival of the British who took up the white man's burden of producing history, civilizing the natives with the aid of the gospel and spreading trade and industry." Unquote. Following the advent of democracy, an initiative was finally set in motion to acquire a third painting. And Cyril Kutsia, the artist whom the university commissioned, set out to make a work that would implicitly critique the values underpinning the other two. Kutsia developed a particular interest in the story of the Adamaster, a monstrous being who appears to Vasco da Gama as he's approaching the Cape of Storms and who figures in the Lusiads, a 16th century poem. Taking as his source a parody of the Lusiads by Andre Brink, Kutsia transforms the Adamaster into a Khoi chief named Takama. Most crucially, he inverts the story of the encounter between Portuguese and indigenous people by representing it from Takama's point of view rather than from that of the colonists. 
The upshot is a work which upsets the efficacy of the narratives in the colonial paintings and makes evident how they're very different ways of speaking of South African history than those in standard narratives. Indeed, the painting is what author James Young would define as a counter monument. That is, a monument which engages self-critically with the monument as a form and which suggests alternative perspectives on historical events. Large-scale monuments associated with Afrikaner nationalism present challenges not unlike those posed by Walgate's representation of Rhodes at UCT or the paintings by Gill and Amshevitz at Witz. A sculpture at the University of the Free State's Bloemfontein campus that was unveiled in 1929 and located in front of the entrance to the university's main building represents Martinus Tiernus Steyn, sixth president of the Orange Free State and a founding member of the National Party. Commissioned from Anton van Vaux, a prominent sculptor of Afrikaner statesmen, the work was paid for through the fundraising efforts of the Afrikaner Studentenbond, an organization with an Afrikaner nationalist agenda. Also in the immediate vicinity um, of the main building is a memorial commemorating the 1938 celebrations of the centenary of the Great Trek, when Afrikaner nationalist ideas reached fever pitch. Amongst those who organized symbolic treks to um, Pretoria um, were 11 students from the university, and two years later, the centenary of the Great Trek would be permanently commemorated through this memorial. And just a few meters away is yet a third object, a sculpture by Johan Mulman depicting C.R. Swat that was unveiled in 1991. Chancellor of the university from 1950 to 1976, Swart, who became the first state president of the Republic of South Africa in 1961, was a member of the Bruderbond and played an active role in various other bodies with Afrikaner nationalist agendas. In 2003, the rector at the time, Frederick Ferry, began to discuss the possibility of adjusting the placement of the Stain sculpture. Fari thought of incorporating onto campus an image of Meshweshwe, celebrated as the founder of the Sutu nation, as well as for his military skills and diplomacy, envisaging that he might serve as an alternative role model and figurehead. But eventually a decision was made to change the kinds of messages invoked by existent monuments on campus, not through relocating the Van Vo work or through the introduction of new statuary, which was traditionalist in type, but rather by motivating to the National Lottery Development Trust Fund for um, monies to acquire a series of artworks that were more up to date in terms of their visual language. And in 2009, the university learned that this had been successful. Angela de Jesus, the new curator employed just after the award had been made, indicates that the motif of the Lechotla was identified as a governing idea underpinning the 16 new works obtained for the campus. Referring to a meeting place in Sesotho or Setswana, it invokes also the idea of a community council or law court where decisions are arrived at by consensus. Two strategies were deployed towards this end. One was to create what De Jesus termed actual meeting places, that is artworks which offered seating in a physical sense. Um, and you could in fact um, sit on the Kumbai um, sculpture, for example. Uh, another was to create um, what she called conversation pieces. That's individual works which prompt discussion because they have subject matter that was difficult, interesting, or controversial. And I think the Vili Besta might be one of those. Although his complex piece would be completed and installed only in 2011, negotiations with Willem Bosov for a key work began early in the process. Bosov's sculpture invokes reference to Drikop's Eiland, a prehistoric site near Kimberley, which includes more than 3,000 engravings or petroglyphs, which are mostly geometric in type, and that have been worked on the glaciated rock forming a bed within the Rit River producing his work from a large rock of Belfast granite, which was polished in such a way that it em em um, emphasized the wetness of the bedrock. 
Borsov sandblasted the boulder to invoke reference to the cracks as well as many of the petroglyphs found on the site. Instead of focusing on a heritage which had seen the University of the Free State framing its identity in terms of Afrikaner nationalist resistance to British imperialism, Borsov turned his attention to indigenous knowledge systems which had long predated the arrival of both Dutch and English speakers to South Africa, suggesting during a filmed visit to Driekops Eiland that, and I'm quoting, the people who made these things are to me the lecturers, the professors, and the students of 2,000 years ago, unquote. He described the site as probably the oldest university we have evidence of in this country. Functioning as a kind of homage to Driekops Eiland University, as he conceived it, Thinking Stone, his work, serves as a literal seat, as well as a locus for interchange and reflection on a modern-day campus. While making reference to prehistoric designs, Borsov also sandblasted onto the boulder various idioms, proverbs, and quotes pertaining to rocks and stones. Each is written in a language used in the Bloemfontein area, whether English, Sesotho, Afrikaans, Isikosa, Isisulu, or Setswana. Rocks and stones were not new to Borsov's iconography. On one level, the stone signifies an, um, a, an imperative to exact retribution. But Borsov's stone is this large granite boulder, far too weighty to throw, and it points implicitly to the futility of violent acts of conflict. Indeed, its title, Thinking Stone, suggests the value of intellectual reflection rather than stone throwing as a way to negotiate difference. But the rock also establishes an ironical relationship with other works on campus where the motif is featured. The plinth at the center of the memorial to the centenary of the Great Trek supports a rock and is encrusted with stones. And relatedly, Moolman's sculpture depicts C.R. Swart seated on roughly hewn boulders, as if he were a pioneer in unfamiliar terrain. A primary trope within Afrikaner nationalist dis discourse, Jennifer Benningfield indicates, and I'm quoting, was the idea that a new nation had been able to discover itself in the isolated and empty interior that was depicted as being without history, ripe, with it for inscription, unquote. This conception is critically inverted in Borsov's work, where rather than alluding to unoccupied virgin territory, the boulder becomes the vehicle for celebrating sophisticated representations which were marked onto the land many years prior to Europeans arriving on Southern African soil. The work also contrasts to those on campus articulating Afrikaner nationalist sentiments through its visual form. Thinking Stone is in diametric opposition to the figure of Stain on his story high plinth, as well as the phallic monument to the centenary of the Great Trek, in the sense that it's low, horizontal, and invites people on the campus to sit on it in the manner of a bench, to touch it, or even to climb on it. Borsov's thinking stone develops from ideas that were evident in his magnificent work we have at the entrance to the main building of our Kingsway campus. And this is also a counter monument. Commissioned in 1999 and completed in 2000, it's comprised of 11 black granite boulders with planed tops and rough hewn sides, each of which includes a spiral of script in which definitions for obscure English words are offered in one of South Africa's 11 official languages. The words chosen are all ologies and isms, and thus invoke reference to the kinds of discourses studied at universities. But rather than being regular research topics, some allude to fields too esoteric to be probable in a contemporary context. Others describe actions that, while sounding erudite, are in fact far removed from the highbrow. And while many amuse, others discomfort the viewer by invoking reference to prejudice or guilt, and thus to ologies and isms which we perhaps ought to study rather more than we do. The Kingsway campus, as, as this audience knows, was established in the mid-1970s. 
While the original buildings here are like others in 1970s Johannesburg that deployed modernist language in such a way as to offer a statement about the power of the apartheid state, the architecture of Rao also presented itself as this concrete bastion intractably resistant to outside forces, a lager-like incursion into anglicized Auckland Park. Reinforcing Afrikaner nationalist meanings implicit within the building, but suggesting that such ideals were somehow also authenticated prehistorically, is a monument on campus comprised of three large boulders. While seeming to have been constructed <coughs> as part of ancient rites, its three component rocks were in fact transported to campus from Paul, the site of the Tal Monument, in 1975. Formally unveiled on the 12th of August that year, the monument was devised to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the establishment of Afrikaans as an official language. But the university that commissioned Willem Borsov in 1999 had changed fundamentally since its founding when its first rector, Professor Gerrit Viljoen, was chairman of the Bruderbond and its first student representative council voted unanimously to support the government's policy of separate universities for separate races. By 1998, Ra had begun providing tuition in both English and Afrikaans for almost all of its programs. And by 2000, more of its students preferred English as their medium of instruction. Poised in the, on the threshold of a new millennium, Ra sought to signify its fundamental transformation by installing a new work on its own threshold. Kling van Kennis offers a key precedent for not only the use of the rock or boulder as motif by, by Borsov, but also its reworking in such a way that it offers a critical response to earlier structures. The work reiterates the circular structure of the buildings, but revises its meanings in important ways. If the lager excludes all that's foreign and extraneous, a round table and Borsov's 11 granite rocks are suggestive of seating for an imbiso, offers opportunities for the democratic exchange of different perspectives. And while sharing with the language monument on campus allusions to prehistoric structures such as Stonehenge, this similarity serves to emphasize their differences. If the 1975 monument on campus was, as Borsov explains, and I'm quoting, regarded as fighting for the supremacy of Afrikaans at the expense of all the other languages spoken in South Africa, unquote, Kring van Kennis gives equal status to all of these tongues. Another strategy for engaging with works associated with values that no longer have currency is to modify them temporarily. This type of engagement, in fact, occurred with Walgate's sculpture at UCT. It's a pity it didn't glean more widespread publicity. On Heritage Day in 2007, a group of graduates who call themselves the Cultural Upstarts Collective embellished the sculpture with soccer regalia, with supersized sunglasses, an adapted miner's hat, um, in the colors of Kaiser Chiefs, and a vuvuzela. Anthony Kaminju and Tabasani and Lovo observe how fans of a team may include somebody called a bishop and who wears a kind of priestly robe and whose role is, as they explain, and I'm quoting, purportedly to intercede between God and the fortunes of the team, unquote. In this instance, the cloak is worn by Rhodes here as the bishop, and it carries the question, whose seat is it anyway? One member of the collective, Rafaela Della Don, explained that the adaptations were intended to, and I'm quoting, challenge the idea that heritage belongs to a static past and to show instead that heritage is inex inextricably um, bound up with the process of looking back as the nation moves forward, unquote. This focus on making heritage relevant within the present was invoked through objects and regalia which are normally used to insist upon the visibility of the soccer fan. Its effect on the sculpture was likewise to make it more rather than less noticeable. Additionally important is what Kaminju and Ndlovo describe as a use of dress and performance to create a carnivalesque atmosphere at soccer matches. If, as Buckton suggests, the carnival offers a space of social transgression through its disturbance of hierarchies and roles, 
This unsettling of meanings is in turn taken on by the sculpture. Rhodes is forced to, as it were, change class and race. The embellished miner's hat is furthermore ironical in the context of a representation of an individual who made his fortune through diamond prospecting. More crucially, the embellishments countered the sculpture's deployment of the colonial trope of looking as possession. Apart from being absurd, the enlarged glasses in effect blocked Rhodes' mastering gaze, couldn't gaze out to Cairo. There was also an intervention to two of the Africana nationalist works at the University of the Free State at the Freyfius in Bloemfontein last year. In a work called Plastic Histories, an Australian artist called Chigdom Ademir shrink-wrapped and sprayed pink the sculptures of Stain and Swart. The artist observed that the intervention developed from her interest in how monuments serve to shape collective memory in public spaces and ensure against the failure of individual memory. But she also recognized that memory doesn't simply fix history in immutable ways, and that it's in fact, as she explains, and I'm quoting, plastic in the sense that it's constantly shaped and molded by our new knowledge of the past, unquote. Shrink wrapping the sculptures developed this idea metaphorically by alluding to vacuum packing as a process used for preservation. Understood in this light, shrink wrapping the monuments prompted critical thought about the degree to which um, the values that may have informed the commissioning, making and installation of these historical objects have or have not been conserved on the campus. Crucial to plastic histories was the decision to spray the shrink wrapping pink, a strategy that might be interpreted as queering the monuments. Queering involves not only rejecting what might be considered legitimate, but also, as the writer Noreen Giffney explains, championing those who refuse to be defined in the terms of and by the moral codes of behavior and identification set down by the dominant society. Thus, while drawing attention to a heteronormativity in public art discourse, spraying the monuments this exuberant and shrill pink involved a disruption to their normalcy in a wider sense that made them peculiar and anomalous. The process of queering tends also to involve an identification of silences and blind spots which underpin discourse. An orientation that in this instance involved prompting viewers to think about not simply whom, those whom these monuments celebrate, but also those whom they marginalize, those whom they exclude. In the words of Edemir, the color pink might be seen as an opportunity to empower and commemorate the unacknowledged and equally deserving rather than those simply in power." Unquote. The University of the Free State has also handled their works particularly appropriately in deliberately incorporating engagement with them into its teaching syllabi. I gather there's an interdisciplinary 101 course which is compulsory for first years and which is comprised of various units which have attached to them what the curator at the university described to me as learning experiences. And discussion of works on campus constitutes the learning experience attached to a unit called How Do We Become Responsible South African Citizens? Jonathan Janssen, writing before the events at UCT, which led to the removal of Walgate's sculpture of Rhodes, indicated that he was delighted that the two statues of Stain and Swart continue to exist on the Free State campus feeling that such retentions offer, as he put it, a way of recognizing the sacred memories of others. But he also observed that retention that does nothing more than recognize those memories is a blow to social justice. And that observation encapsulates some aspects of what I've been trying to suggest in this inaugural address. But I'd like to suggest retention is in fact desirable also to ensure respect for the memories of those who were marginalized or disadvantaged through the influence of ideologies with which the sculptures concerned are associated. As I've indicated in this address, monuments and sculptures produced under the influence of British imperialism or Afrikaner nationalism have the potential to be part of the processes we use to explore how our complex histories have informed our present circumstances. 
it consequently makes sense for us to regard the visibility of such works not as hampering institutional change, but instead as potentially assisting us to glean understandings to shape a different kind of future. Thank you very much. Really amazing. And I must say, the statues look a hell of a lot better at best of in pink. <laughs> um, it's now my very great pleasure to um, ask our respondent, Professor Carolyn Hamilton, who is NRF Chair in Archive and Public Culture at the University of Cape Town, to present her remarks. Carolyn. <laughs> Uh, registrar, uh, dean, colleagues, and friends, it's um, it's really a great honour to be invited to respond at to uh, to this inaugural address here at the University of Johannesburg, of my valued colleague and my very dear friend. In fact, I hope I hit the right button. My. <laughs> My oldest friend. <laughs> Thanks very much to Paul Mills, who excavated that out of the archive for us. Um, now, the deeply creative, completely reliable, and intense girlhood friend who kept me in line, I must tell you, with plat pulling and arguments as fierce as my own, is now my and your deeply intelligent, highly productive, entirely principled, stellar professor. And my guess is that metaphorically, she's still a fierce puller of plats when the occasion <laughs> demands. And I know that her arguments are only all the more astute these days. Now, there can be no one amongst us who does not appreciate the value and thoughtfulness of Brenda's scholarship as demonstrated tonight. It goes to the heart of the paroxysms that rack the South African university system at the moment. Now, at a time when the Japanese are closing down their humanities faculties and their arts faculties, when science and technology actually floods the, spa the space of planning for the future, and when humanities generally are under threat, we are in danger of killing off the research that we most need to navigate relationships, re relationships amongst ourselves, amongst us as fellow human beings. Now, the prescient humanities and arts scholars begin the necessary research well in advance of the hour of its most urgent need. Brenda, in fact, was my guest at the UCT campus to present her research on the visual representation of roads and the visual culture of South African universities in May 2011, four years before the forced removal of the infamous statue. Now, in her inaugural address, Brenda recognizes that the removal of the UCT Road statue was probably the only feasible step, she says, in the face of a protest where much more than simply the statue was at stake. But her address draws us back a step or two from the political precipice to oblige us to think carefully and more carefully again about what she calls, and it's really a big phrase from her address, the slippery terrain of evaluating art, especially in this charged environment of transformation. Removal, she, su she suggests, may just be too easy and not substantial enough, not reflective enough, not generative enough. Now, I think Brenda has earned the right to call for more because that is a call that she has always responded to. It's a call which her own work testifies to. to. Her own wor work never takes the easy route. She's never balked at an intellectual challenge. Now, one of Brenda's publications that takes no easy route is on the work of the Kaiskama Art Project which you saw in her address. 
in the Rhodes um, Council Chamber. That's a project deep in the heart of rural Eastern Cape. The work that she deals with most recently, in the words that are preferred by the project itself, is a lament for the dead, for the injustices of our health system, and the staggering grief experienced in Eastern Cape villages today. Now, that particular tapestry, the Cascama Guernica, leverages off Picasso's painful Guernica. But, as Brenda shows so skillfully, in ways deeply embedded in and resonant with the history of the Eastern Cape. Brenda's analysis does justice to this complex work because of the more that she pours into understanding what it, this extraordinarily potent work, is in the world today. <coughs> now, there'll be those of you who are present tonight who know her work, who know that full body of work that undergirds this professorship. Well, effectively, I think something like a double professorship now. It's a prodigious body of work, and, uh, and Fed told us, six books, two exhibitions, I think it's over 50 scholarly articles. So you who know me will be able to join me in testifying um, to those who have not read it what an impressive body of work it is. Now, the range, the sheer range of Brenda's work is truly breathtaking. There are those early interventions on Roy Lichtenstein's critique of modernism. And then she goes on to engage the visual in the politics of everything, from gender to Zimbabwean land struggles. I spent the early part of this week reading recent publications that I had not yet encountered. Brenda's work is marked by crystalline clarity of thought and writing and a rigor of research that few of us can equal. It's thorough and it's meticulous. It's work to be relished and relied on. In the current crisis, her latest research on the visual culture of the universities is a timely humanities gift to us all. It's one that I imagine that the beleaguered vice chancellor, one of whom couldn't be here tonight, will, will really value, as well as the thoughtful students will want to grapple with. We have to wonder why this kind of work and other similar work which universities laud is not research which the universities, we, take on board in relation to ourselves. So when I return tomorrow to UCT, it will be to work on the university task team to assess artworks on display across the campus, artworks that have been identified by the Roads Must Fall movement as problematic. Schmarman 2013 is prescribed reading for the entire committee. <laughs> Radical students and academics alike. But Brenda, I would not want us simply to read Schmarman on the portraits and statues of white males, but also to understand the recuperative and suturing work of women in applique tapestry and embroidery in small craft projects across Southern Africa, and to understand what it means to bring into a single frame these different worlds, the world of the university and the craft project, to seek ourselves to inhabit that same shared frame, to factor in matters of gender and class and indeed sexual preference, where race occupies the central space, is a task that many of the pro protesting students have committed themselves to. And the manner of its refraction through art is potent matter. It's far from easy. In this professorship, Registrar Dean, the University of Johannesburg has a scholar of exceptional distinction with the research expertise, the intellectual depth and range, and the integrity to handle potent matter and to help shape and renew humanities and arts thought at an extraordinary time. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in once again congratulate Brenda on an excellent lecture. Uh, thought to, you know, and very well presented. We really thank you and we really congratulate you. And then also to Professor Hamilton for that very insightful um, response. Uh, we really thank your presence also here tonight. Colleagues, I now, I now invite you. I now invite you to join us for some refreshments. We will just leave now.